Hello, I'm making this recording actually in advance of the uh, review session in the, in the second week on uh, October 6th because uh, I, I know that the automatic system is not going to work. I've been clued into it. Uh, I'm hoping it will be fixed soon and then we'll have the actual recording to the review session. But I'm making this recording to cover the material for people that aren't able to attend the review session. I know there's a few people who have contacted me about that. Uh, and so this is the same content as the review sessions, uh, which will be happening on Wednesday. Uh, I want to make a few announcements before we get going. So you should have an idea of what is required now for the diagnostic follow-up assignment. So the diagnostic follow-up assignment is the first assignment you need to complete that's part of your mark in the class. And uh, you, there was a session uh, yesterday on Tuesday uh, that gave you some information about uh, what you needed to do. Uh, some people probably missed this session, and if you if you didn't miss it, then there's also information that's available on Blackboard. So if you go to the main course content area, you should see a folder that's labeled as diagnostic follow-up, and there's information in that folder for what you need to do for the diagnostic follow-up assignment. So uh, essentially, uh, depending on how you've done on the diagnostic test, you have to complete certain sections uh, which are done online. Uh, there's practice and assessment versions of those, and you do have to complete them both for your mark. And so there's more details of that in the folder on Blackboard. Uh, if you do have any questions about it, uh, feel free to contact me. You can ask questions uh, by the, through the discussion form on Blackboard or, or contact me via email. Uh, for this recording, there, there's no Slido session, so you can ignore this second announcement here. So, uh, one of the topics we cover in the second week is a kind of an application of partial derivatives. It's this chain rule for partial derivatives. So it's shown here on the slide. And what we were thinking here is we have a function h, which is actually given as a composition of a, a function f, which depends on two variables, which are labeled here as x and y. And then each of those variables depend on uh, some third variable t. And so h is a function of t, but it's sort of a function that's created in this, in this way as a composition, f a function of two variables, and then each of those variables a function of another variable, t. Okay, and so the chain rule that we apply for this case of uh, composition, of a function with more than uh, one variable, is what's shown here. We can take the derivative of this, and so this h prime here means the derivative of this function h with respect to t, the variable t. And that's given uh, by this expression, the uh, derivative. It's the partial derivative of the function f with respect to x times the derivative of x with respect to t, plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to t. And it's written out here in the uh, uh, Newton notation, or sorry, the Leibniz notation as well. Okay, and so uh, we covered this in the videos for this week. I'm going to do an example here in the review session. Uh, and this is uh, kind of an application. We, we suppose we have a car that's moving along a, a straight road, here a straight line, and its function, or sorry, its position as a function of time, t, is given by these formulas. So v here would be uh, the velocity the car is moving or the speed the car is moving. Uh, the Cosine theta, sine theta is a, well, the theta is the angle that the uh, road makes with the positive x-axis, and then t would be would be time. And if you think about uh, how that would a uh, straight road with those characteristics that passes through the origin would be uh, given it being given by these formulas. And so the x position of the car as a function of time is given by v times cosine of theta times t. The y position given by v times sine of theta times t. And the velocity, v, and this angle that the road makes with the positive x-axis, we assume are constant. So that means the car is going along in a straight road and at a, at a constant speed. Right, the, however, the elevation changes. And so the elevation given by this function a, h depends on the position x and y. And what we want to know is what is the elevation of the car as a function of time? So uh, that is h prime of t. Okay, and so we want to take the derivative of this uh, function h uh, with respect to time. 
I realize that, that maybe some of you are saying that this isn't really the velocity. This is the velocity in the xy plane. You're moving up the velocity would be perhaps a bit different, but it's velocity in the xy plane. Okay, so, uh, but this is just an example of applying this chain rule. We have this function h, which is the function f here, and uh, we have the x and y, which are functions of t, and we want to apply the chain rule in order to calculate the derivative of the height as a function of time. And so let's do this. So the, in order to apply this, we want to calculate the partial derivatives of this function h with respect to time. So dh, or sorry, with respect to x and y. So dh dx and dh dy. And uh, I'm going to ask you to do this. So uh, in the review session, I give people a chance to answer one of these. What I suggest if you're watching this video after the review session is that you pause the video and uh, spend a, a few minutes or however long it takes you, working out what this partial derivative dh dx is. So I've written up h here for you. Think, find out, figure out what dh dx is and, and see which uh, answer you would select. I'll give you a second to pause and then continue on. All right, so the correct answer is number two here. dh dx, it's written here in terms of h, which is maybe a bit confusing, but it's given by this second answer. And I'm going to uh, work that out on the visualizer in order to show you in case you're confused about calculating this partial derivative. So uh, let's switch to the visualizer and I'll work that out. All right, so let me once again write down what h was. h is the square root of 200 squared um, minus uh, 1 over 10 times x minus 100 squared. I've not specified the units here, but about meters. Not too important for this example to say what the units are. Units. All right, so this was, was what h was, and we wanted to calculate uh, dh dx, the partial derivative of h with respect to x. And so uh, we do that by applying the chain rule. And so when we apply the chain rule, we first of all, uh, this is a composition of the, the function, which is the, well, the square root function, and then the squared function is here. And so when we apply the chain rule, first of all, we take the derivative of the square root, which is like what the uh, quantity inside the square root is raised to the one half power. And so you get one half times that uh, expression raised to the negative one-half power by the rule for calculating derivatives of powers to the negative one-half and then times the derivative of the inside with respect to x so the partial derivative of the inside of this uh, these parentheses with respect to x and well the first term here is a constant that's 200 squared last term also only depends on y and y is being treated as a constant when we do the partial derivative so that last term is zero as well, and we only have the middle term here. And the derivative of that, well, we take the derivative of the x minus 100 squared, and you get uh, times 2 x minus 100, and we still have the 1 tenth, so divided by 10. All right, so this is the expression for the partial derivative once we've used the chain rule in order to calculate it. Uh, the, Two here cancels with the two here, the one half there, and uh, we therefore get uh, this button, these multiplied together. Uh, and it looks like I forgot the minus here. So when we take the derivative of this middle term, we should have had a, a minus, so this should have been that times minus one. That minus. All right, and so you know, one thing you can notice is that uh, this is actually one over h. So uh, this entire expression in parentheses to the negative one half is one over h and so uh, this first line becomes one over h and then we have a negative one there and x minus 100 divided by 10 and uh, that was the the second option there maybe you can write it a little bit more simply if we combine things together so negative x minus 100 divided by 10h. All right, 
So this is a partial derivative of this function uh, with respect to x. How about if we take the partial derivative with respect to y? So take the partial derivative here, and it works very much the same way. All right, we take do dh dy, partial derivative with respect to y. And so uh, we apply the chain rule again. When you differentiate the square root, you get the 1 half. And I'm just going to write this here as 1 over h in order to save the notation. Uh, 1 half, and it was that uh, quantity inside the square root raised to the negative 1 half power, but that's the same as 1 over h. Uh, and then times uh, the derivative of what's inside the square root here with respect to y. And the first term here is constant, so when you take the derivative with respect to y, it's 0. Second term also constant, so derivative with respect to y is 0. And then the third term here, you get negative 2 divided by 10 times y minus 150. So negative 1 times 2 divided by 10 times y minus 150. Right, so the partial derivative with respect to y, these cancel out again, is negative y minus 150 divided by 10h. Right, and remember, this was the partial derivative h with respect to x. And now we want to calculate the derivative of h with respect to t. And so uh, we use the, the formulas. Um, we also need the formulas for x. So x is a function of time was this v cosine of theta t. And y as a function of time was v sine theta t. And we, in order to apply the formula for the uh, uh, chain rule, in this case, we needed to differentiate these with respect to time t dx to t, dx dt is v cosine of theta, and dy dt is v sine of theta. Okay. The v cosine of theta and v sine of theta are just constants. Okay, and then uh, <clears throat> we use the uh, uh, formula for the chain rule. So we have the, all the information we need, the two partial derivatives, the derivatives uh, with, of x and y with respect to time, and so now apply the chain rule. So apply chain rule. And so uh, h prime of t equals uh, dh dx times dx dt plus dh dy times dy dt. And we just put in the formulas that we found. Negative x minus 100 divided by 10h v cosine of theta minus y minus 150 divided by 10h v sine of theta. Okay, so this would be this derivative. I'm editing this in because I uh, drew an incorrect graph of the function h first, and I wanted to correct that. And so, uh, yeah, just to visualize what's happening in this example, we draw some axes, and uh, we have uh, the horizontal axes here, are x and y. We label the vertical vertical axis h for the the height. And in the xy plane, then the car is going along a straight line. So this line is in the plane, xy plane, the, the flat plane. That should be straight. Uh, makes that angle theta, the positive x-axis. And then uh, <clears throat> the velocity the car is moving along this line is, is v. So it's projected down to the xy plane. So it moves along this line with speed v. And but then uh, there's this uh, hill or something, so it's a change in elevation, and uh, that has its peak at uh, this point uh, x equals 100 and y equals 150, so projected down into the xy plane, and 
the height there would be 200. I haven't drawn things to scale here, but it has a peak there, and then uh, it kind of looks like the uh, top of it. Well, it, technically it's an uh, ellipsoid, but it has a sort of smooth top. So I'm drawing uh, curves of constant height here, kind of decrease and uh, go down like this. Kind of slow decrease away from that point where it's the maximum height. And as the car moves along this uh, road with the XY coordinates along that straight line, I would kind of uh, increase and go over this sort of ridge here, decrease back down. So curve right here is on the surface of the graph of H uh, and above this curve in the XY plane, the straight line is moving along. So it goes up over this kind of ridge, and we're looking at the change in the height as the car moves along. So the graph of the function h is this ellipsoid. It kind of has a peak here, and then increases away from that. <clears throat> now, uh, so first example, um, another sort of application that we studied of partial derivatives was in finding error estimates. So this is actually quite an important point. Uh, a lot of times you'll measure some quantities and then you want to calculate something based on what you've measured. So in the setup we've studied, you assume you measure two things which are labeled as X and Y here. And then you measure, or sorry, you calculate something based on those measurements. So you calculate a third quantity which is labeled as Z based on x and y. So z is some function f of x and y. Uh, but the problem is when you actually measure something in the real world, there's some error associated with the measurement. And is, there is therefore error associated with the calculated quantity, z. And you want to say, uh, how much should the error in z be uh, if you know what the error in your two measured quantities are? So there's an error in the measured quantity for a variable x, also for a variable y, those are delta x and delta y, and we want to say, what should the error in the calculated quantity z be? Right? And so the formula that we gave, that's explained a bit more in the, in the videos, uh, is this one. So we say the size of the error, delta z, is the absolute value of the partial derivative of f with respect to x times the error in x, plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times the error in y. Okay, and so there are some caveats in the video. There are a few different formulas that are sometimes used for computed error, but this is just one example. It is a formula that's used, but you may want to see the video. There's, there's a bit of a caveat there. But this is an example of using partial derivatives. Okay, um, so let's look at an example of, of applying this formula in order to say what the, what the error in a calculated quantity should be based on some measurements. And so, Suppose that we want to measure the speed that a car is traveling, and we do this by uh, measuring the distance that it moves in a certain amount of time. And so we want to then calculate the speed based on the distance we've measured and the time we've measured. And so the question is, in order to apply uh, this type of error estimate, what should f be in this case? So. I'll give you a second to pause the video, and then I'll go on and say what the answer is. So, Okay, so now I'll say the answer. So the speed uh, is the distance divided by the time. And so if you knew the exact distance traveled for a given time, then you could say what the exact speed was. The function f in this case should be the distance divided by the time. That's the speed. Okay, and so... <coughs> Let's look more specifically at an example and actually calculate uh, what the error that we would report in the measurement of the speed is based on measurements of the distance and the amount of time it takes to travel a certain distance. So say we measure the distance traveled in a certain time is 10 meters plus or minus uh, 25 centimeters and the time that we measure is 0 0.9 seconds plus or minus 0 0.05 seconds. We want to say, how accurately can we determine s? And I apologize that I've used seconds for the unit here and s for speed as well. I hope this 
doesn't cause confusion. So here in T in seconds, and this is uh, S for speed. Maybe I should have used V. So there it is. And so let's say, uh, what, what would be the, the error here? Let's move over to the visualizer and, and work this out. All right, and so the, the formula that we have for the speed is again, the distance over time. If we knew the exact distance and exact time, that's what it would be. Uh, and uh, so we want to apply that formula in order to calculate uh, the error that we should report, right? And so the, the speed that we report is uh, 10 meters divided by 0 0.9 seconds. So imported in meters per second. But we're just going to calculate the, the reported error. So our measurements were the distance is uh, approximately 10 meters with the error of plus or minus uh, 25 centimeters. Or if we convert these centimeters to meters, it's 10 meters plus or minus 0 0.25 meters. And the time is 0 0.9 seconds plus or minus, uh, it was 0 0.05 seconds. And so once again, these are the seconds. This is speed. <clears throat> All right, and so, uh, well, the error in the speed, the error in this function f in this case that we've used, um, and the uh, formula that's given says that this is the derivative of f with respect to the distance, the first variable d, times the error in the measurement of the distance, plus the partial derivative of f with respect to the time, t, times the error in the measurement of the time, t. All right, so first let's calculate what these partial derivatives are. So they're fairly easy derivatives to calculate. The f d d is just one over t. t is treated like a constant, so one over t times the error measured in the distance, d, less the f d t is negative d over t squared. When we take the derivative of 1 over t times the error in t, delta t. <clears throat> and uh, so this is the formula that we have. And uh, maybe we get rid of the absolute values and uh, write this as absolute value of 1 over t split up the absolute values. And here this negative sign, we can get rid of it. We get this way. And so now let's identify uh, what we're going to plug in here. So D here is the distance we measure. So that's 10 meters, right? This is the D that we're going to plug in here. The error in the measurement of D is this 0 0.25 meters? That's the uh, error in the measurement of d. Let me plug in there. Uh, then the t is uh, 0 0.9 seconds. We plug in in these two cases, places. And uh, delta t, the error in the measurement of t, 0 0.05 seconds. All right, and so if we put all that in, we have the the error in the measurement of the speed is uh, 1 over t, so that's uh, 1 over 0 0.9 seconds uh, times uh, the error in the measurement of the distance is 0 0.25 meters, the so delta d there, and then uh, plus d was 10 meters here, divided by 0 0.9 seconds squared times the error in the time, which is 0 0.05 seconds. All right, so that's what the, we would report as the error in the measured speed. Now at the point where you would put this into your calculator, and uh, if I've done the calculation correctly, uh, we get 0 0.8951 uh, meters per second. <clears throat> once we've calculated this whole quantity, and that's the approximate error.
And so, uh, once again, this is uh, the error in F. And so, uh, the speed that we would give is uh, uh, the distance measured divided by the time. That's 10 meters divided by 0 0.9 seconds, plus or minus this error, which is 0 0.8951 meters per second all right so let's continue on the, the next topic uh, that we cover is integration <coughs> and so here uh, is the basic explanation of integration so the, the definite integral of a function which is uh, written here this is the definite integral of this function f between two points a and b is this yellow area shown here. So if the graph of this function f, y equals f of x, is the black line, then this definite integral is the area in between that graph and the x-axis between the two points x equal a and x equal b. And if it goes below the x-axis, then the area is counted as negative. So this is what we mean by a definite integral. <laughs> and uh, definite integrals can be calculated by finding antiderivatives, or what we sometimes call indefinite integrals, using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And this is really the most important thing in calculus. Um, so this concept here. So if we want to calculate this definite integral, which once again represents the yellow area, and we know a function capital F whose derivative is lowercase f, then this area is given by capital F at B minus capital F at A. This is what the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us. And so uh, motivated by this, uh, well, it shows us that if we want to find these definite integrals, these areas between the function and the x-axis, what we really want is we want to find these functions capital F, whose derivatives are the integrand, lowercase f. And so motivated by this, we introduce the idea of the indefinite integral, which is the set of all functions uh, whose derivatives are the integrand f. So we say that the capital F plus this constant c is the integral, indefinite integral of lowercase f if the derivative of capital F equals lowercase f. Right? So when you take the derivative of a constant, you get zero, and so uh, we can always add a constant to the indefinite integral. So we always have to include this constant here, arbitrary constant c. So an indefinite integral is really the set of all functions whose derivative, who have the derivative lowercase f. And so intuitively, integration is the opposite of differentiation. Right? So we, we just studied how to diff, do derivatives last week. Integrals are doing the opposite. So finding functions whose derivatives are a given function. All right, so let's uh, do a quick example. Uh, what is the uh, indefinite integral of the hyperbolic sign uh, of x, so this function here. So why don't you pause the video if you're watching this and try to figure it out yourself. You can start it again once you're happy you have an answer. Okay, the answer here is the hyperbolic cosine of x plus a constant. And so um, Remember that the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine is the hyperbolic sine, and so this indefinite integral is the hyperbolic cosine plus a constant. All right, and so we study a number of methods of finding indefinite integrals. These are called methods of integration. Uh, and we look at essentially three different methods. The first one is called integration by parts and is really the uh, kind of opposite of the product rule. So the product rule is a rule for Differentiation, integration by parts, is what you get when you uh, integrate the product rule. Uh, substitution is the second um, method that we study, and it's really the opposite of the chain rule. So you integrate the chain rule, rule for differentiation, and uh, that gives you a rule for integration, and it's called substitution. And we intuitively think of substitution as being you substitute one variable for another. And we'll look at an example of this. And then the final method is partial fractions which is a, a way to simplify rational functions. Rational functions are functions that are a ratio of two polynomials. And so partial fractions is a way to split these up into individual terms where you can recognize the uh, integrals. 
All right, and so let's look at an example of doing an integral, and this is a definite integral. So a definite integral of this function that's given here between the points zero and the square root of pi over two. So I'll ask you uh, in the poll, which method should you use in order to do this? So I'll pause the video, think, decide what you think, and start it when you're ready. All right, the method here, I think a lot of people think integration by parts because they see this sine and cosine and the exponential and sometimes integration by parts works in other cases. But the method here is actually substitution that we want to use. And the reason it's substitution, it's maybe a bit hidden, is because you can recognize that one part of this integrand is a derivative of another part. In particular, if you take the derivative of the cosine of x squared here, and you get negative 2x sine of x squared, and that's how you can see that you should use substitution. But let's go over the, the details of this. Let's switch to uh, visualizer. All right, and so we want to do this uh, integral. Integral from 0 to the square root pi over 2 of uh, 2x e to the cosine of x squared sine of x squared dx <clears throat> right and once again you recognize that negative 2x sine of x squared is the derivative of cosine of x squared and so you make the substitution u equal cosine of x squared Okay, so as covered in the videos, I think the best way to uh, do these substitutions now is to calculate du. And du is simply what you get when you take the derivative of this cosine of x squared with respect to x. So I'll write it out to be clear what I'm doing. The derivative of this with respect to x times dx. Right? This is really a formal notation for calculating how you should change the dx when you do substitution. And the derivative of cosine of x squared with respect to x is negative sine of x squared. This is using the chain rule times 2x dx. And so when we do this substitution, we should change negative sine of x squared 2x dx to du. And uh, we can multiply this by negative 1. And so sine of x squared 2x dx, which appears in this integrand, becomes negative du. All right, and we may as well substitute the limits at the same time, right? So these are the limits for x, right? This is the integral as x goes from 0 to square root of pi over 2. Let's calculate what they would be if we make the substitution to u. So at x equal 0, u we substitute in x equals 0 here, we get u equals cosine of 0, that's 1. And at x equal the square root of pi over 2, of u equals cosine of pi over 2 squared, so that's pi over 2, and that's equal to 0. All right, so one point here is that, of course, we are using radians for the angle. And this angle is in radians. Uh, in mathematics, we almost always use radians for the angle. That, 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 when we use radians, that then we have the, the formula for the derivative of cosine being negative sine. If you don't use radians, then that, that, that formula is no longer true. You have to change it a little bit. So we're using radians for the angle. All right, and so uh, let's make this substitution. So this equals an integral, right? So at x equals 0. U is 1, so the integral from 1. And at uh, x equal pi, square root of pi over 2, u is 0. So the integral from 1 to 0. And then this 2x sine of x squared dx becomes negative du. I'll put that here. And then e to the cosine of x squared is e to the u. Okay, and so it becomes this integral. Now, one of the uh, rules about integrals is that the integral from 1 to 0 is negative the integral from 0 to 1. That's how we define the integral when the limits are in the wrong order. So the one, the one that's larger comes in the bottom. 
And so that if we switch these and you get a negative sign which cancels with this negative sign, this is the integral from zero to one of e to the u du. All right, and so now uh, this integral is not so hard uh, because we can recognize that the uh, antiderivative or indefinite integral of e to the u is simply e to the u, and there, there would be a constant, but when we do these indefinite, or when we do these definite integrals, we don't need to have the constant. So the antiderivative is e to the u, or indefinite integral, as if e to the u evaluated between the limits 1 and 0. And what I mean by this notation is e to the u evaluated at u equal 1, so that's e to the 1, minus e to the 0. So this is this function, which was capital F when I was explaining the integral evaluated at point 1, minus this function, capital F evaluated at point 0. And of course, e to the 0 is 1, so we can write this as e minus 1. Right, so this is this definite integral. It's e minus 1. All right. Turn to the slides. Okay, and, and now we'll, we'll do another example of calculating an integral. This one is going to use integration by parts. And so do the indefinite integral that's shown there. We want to find the indefinite integral of x times hyperbolic cosine of 3x. And we do uh, this by integration by parts. Here we should use integration by parts. And so uh, one of these formulas here gives us the correct first step in integration by parts. And uh, why don't you pause the video and try to work out which one you think it is by doing integration by parts here. Okay, uh, the correct answer here is actually number four. And so let me go over that and actually cal fully calculate this indefinite integral. <clears throat> All right, so the indefinite integral that we are trying to calculate here is... Uh, integral of x hyperbolic cosine of 3x dx. And just to really break it down, uh, maybe it's, it's useful to remember the general formula for integration by parts. So remember how integration by parts works. And so you want to take the integral of a function u, this is an indefinite integral, of a function u times a function v, or the derivative of a function v, say with respect to x, then this is u times v minus the indefinite integral of u prime times v dx. This prime is a derivative with respect to x, right? And so uh, what we've done here really is taken the derivative off of v and moved it over to u, but we have to add in this, this term uv when we do that. And so we split the integrand up into two parts, u and v, and moved the derivative. And so this is the general formula, right? So let's apply that in this example. We should decide what we want to be u and what we want to be the derivative of v, <clears throat> right? And so, uh, in these type of examples where there's a, a polynomial in front, usually you want that to be u because then you take a derivative of it and it gets simpler. So you take the derivative of x here, that just becomes 1, and that will make things simpler, hopefully. All right, so let's do that. We say u equals x, and the derivative of v equals the hyperbolic cosine of 3x. All right, and so we need to calculate u prime which is here. So derivative of u with respect to x is 1, derivative of x. And then we need to integrate this uh, hyperbolic cosine. Uh, so you just need a, a function so that its derivative is this hyperbolic cosine of 3x. And you could do this if you wanted to substitute in u equal 3x and then work out all those details. Uh, but you get good at these, you can recognize that when you apply the chain rule and differentiate this, that's going to result in a, another factor of 3 coming out. And so in order to account for that, you have to divide by 3. Right? So the v will be hyperbolic sine of 3x divided by 3. And you can check this if you don't believe me. <laughs> you think I did it too fast by taking the derivative. So when you apply the chain rule here, you take the derivative of hyperbolic sine, you get hyperbolic cosine, and you have to take the derivative of 3x, 
back to x, you get three, and those threes cancel. So you get this uh, u prime. Okay. And so you apply integration by parts with, with uh, these choices of u and v. And so when we do that, you get that this integral equals u times v. So that's x times the hyperbolic sine of 3x divided by 3 uh, minus this integral of u prime, which is just 1. I'm not going to write that in. Uh, times v, which is the hyperbolic sine of 3x divided by 3 dx. Okay, so that was the fourth option in the whole. <clears throat> right, and so we still needed to do this, but now you can do this integral. Uh, well, you could again do a substitution u equal 3x and work it out and we'll do more steps if it's, it's unclear to you. But you can also uh, recognize that uh, the integral of the hyperbolic sine is going to be hyperbolic cosine, and then you need to divide by another factor of 3 in order to account for the 3 that comes from the, the chain rule if you were differentiating. So you can get x, the hyperbolic sine of 3x divided by 3, that's the same, the first term, minus the hyperbolic cosine of 3x, and you have to divide by 9. So that's another factor of 3 in the denominator. And now we need to add the arbitrary constant here. Okay, and so this is the integral, indefinite integral of x times the hyperbolic cosine of 3x. All right. That's that example. All right, uh, so <coughs> the final topic studied this week, which you may or may not have gotten to in the videos, and so uh, maybe you want to come back and watch this later if you haven't seen it in the videos yet, but it's in Macaulay brackets. And uh, this is really, a, this is, I think, something that surprises a lot of people because many people haven't seen it before. Uh, but uh, Macaulay brackets are, are, what they are is a system of notation for writing down functions that are either discontinuous, like have a jump, like you see in this uh, first function here, or uh, the derivative has a jump, like the, the slope changes rapidly, or even the second derivative has a jump. And so this Macaulay bracket uh, no notation here is a bracket notation for a step function, so a function at zero up to a certain point and then jumps up to one. And this is the definition. So the Macaulay bracket, the zero, order zero Macaulay bracket of x minus a is equal to zero if x is less than or equal to a and equal to one if x is greater than a. So zero up until a, this is the graph of the function here that we see on the right, and then it jumps up to one. All right, the Regular, what, what we just call Macaulay bracket is the, is the second one here. You note that this has a zero. Uh, this one has nothing, but we could think of it as having a one there if you wanted. We usually just don't write the one. All right, so this Macaulay bracket of x minus a is uh, this function which is equal to x minus a if x is greater than a, equal to zero if x is less than or equal to a. Uh, this, so the graph of this looks like a ramp. It's often called, sometimes called the ramp function. It's flat zero up until x equal a, and then it uh, has slope one, changes the uh, line of slope one uh, when x is greater than a. Right, and if you square this, so you have the order two Macaulay bracket, or really it's this uh, Macaulay bracket squared, then uh, we just get uh, this function. So the function is you just square this x minus a, when x is greater than a, and you square the zero when x is less than or equal to a, you can get zero again. So we have x minus a squared, and it looks like this parabola that comes out from starting at a. All right, so these are the uh, Macaulay brackets. It's a notation for describing functions or for writing functions that are discontinuous or have discontinuous derivatives. All right, let's look at an example of using Macaulay brackets in order to see why you might want to use this notation. So here's a, here's a function which uh, looks pretty complicated, but uh, what I, I kind of hope to convince you is that it's easier to write this type of function using a Macaulay bracket notation. All right. So first of all, this function is zero uh, when x is less than negative one. All right. So this would be the x axis and y axis. 
And uh, let's say, we see we need to get up to five. All right, so let's say this is negative one, and the function is zero up to negative one. All right, then at negative one, it uh, will jump up to uh, one. There's one. And it is equal to one in for x in between uh, negative one and one. We're not going to be so concerned what it is right at the jumps. Some people have a notation for how you draw the graph. I guess uh, at the jump it's actually zero. It's not so not so important for us, All right? And so then in between one and two, uh, it is this function uh, x plus one and so that means that uh, right at one uh, that equals two so it jumps up to two and then it has the slope one right so it jumps up to two and then it's uh, like slope one so this is one and uh, there's two and, and this would be three <clears throat> all right and uh, then between uh, Two and three, it's equal to two. And then uh, when it was uh, greater than three, uh, it's five minus x. And so let's see, when it's right at three, it's uh, uh, equal to two. And it has slope negative one. Four. Five. This is two. And so it goes, it starts at this point here, and it has slope negative one, goes down to five. And then uh, it's equal to zero when x is bigger than five. So here's the graph of this function. It's a, it's a bit complicated. Um, Mm, okay, meant to. Okay, so here's the graph of this function. It's a bit complicated, so this is y equals f. Let's write a formula for it using Macaulay brackets. So when we do this, what we want to do is we want to start here at the left. And every time there's a jump, you need to add some Macaulay brackets in order to accommodate how the function changes. So the function, first of all, jumps from 0 to 1 at x equal negative 1. So we can write x plus 1, 0 Macaulay bracket to capture this jump. Right, so this is a just if we just had this, what we'd have is a function that was zero up until negative one, and then jumped up to to one. And so if we only had this term, it would just continue being equal to one for all x bigger than negative one. But we have to uh, now get this next jump at x equal one. Right, and so this one, uh, so once again jumps by one, all right, so this is discontinuity. And so in order to capture the discontinuity, we have the zero order Macaulay bracket, which causes it to jump up. So if we just had these two terms, we have a function that goes up and at x equal negative one, it jumps up to one. And then at x equal one, it jumps again up to two. But we also have the fact that it's uh, this line of slope one. And so in order to get that, it's not just this flat line here, we add a Macaulay bracket that makes it uh, slope one. So that would be x minus one, okay? Now, when it gets to two, it drops down. So we have to subtract off uh, x minus two, zero. So that would drop us down to here. And then uh, also it changes from slope one to being this flat line. So if we simply had these ones, then it would continue, the graph would continue like this. But we need to subtract a function in order to make it so that it's this flat line. And what you have to subtract is uh, x minus two. 
my coffee back. Okay, and then uh, we get to this final place, well, actually the second to last place where it changes, which is at x equal 3. And uh, here it changes from slope 0 to slope negative 1. So if we only had what we've written so far, it would simply continue like this. And so we have to add a term that makes it so that it, it goes down the slope negative 1 in between 3 and 5. So x minus 3, the curly bracket. And then finally, the last place where it changes it is at x equal 5. And so we get this uh, plus. Uh, x minus 5, we'll call it bracket. We have to add this in, because if we didn't have this term, it would simply continue with slope negative 1 here. We have to add this to make it so that it is a flat line here. Okay, so this function written out using Macaulay brackets is, is given by this. So uh, this might not actually look a whole lot more simpler than <laughs> the function that was given on the slide. Um, there's a, a lot of terms in this case, um, but it, it's actually a lot easier to integrate. So one of the big advantages of doing these, these types of notations is that you wanted to, to do an integral of this. You could actually just integrate each of these terms uh, as if they were uh, <clears throat> regular parentheses, right? So the integral of this one would just be the Macaulay bracket of x plus 1. This 0 would become 1, and so on. So it actually makes the integration easier. And there's a bit about this in the video and also the example sheets. And I'll leave this example here. All right, and so that's all the uh, uh, examples that I was planning to do in the uh, uh, review session. Uh, answer some questions also in the review session, but uh, I'm not going to do that here in the in the video. If you do have any questions that you want to ask me, uh, please put them in the discussion board on uh, Blackboard, or you can send me an email. All right, I look forward to seeing you at the next review session or possibly tutorial.